Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us uh, for the panel on population health management. Especially, I don't know how many of you heard the keynote speaker. I think that was a good segue into our conversation. Uh, we have a distinguished panel that will be discussing this topic in details, and we are hoping that we're going to be able to have a very engaging conversation with the audience, hear your perspective on that too. And for that purpose, I would like to see by show of hands the audience that we have here. So I'm going to ask, you know, if you would kindly raise your hands if you consider yourself a clinician or part of a provider organization. Okay? How many are part of like health plans or the payer segment of the industry? How many are technologists? Mostly the IT. Okay? So it looks like a good number of IT people too because our panelists wanted to know that. So the way we're going to proceed that, I'm going to ask each panelist to uh, briefly introduce herself and talk about their organization's perspective of definition of population management and where they are. And we will get three perspectives of that. We'll pause, hopefully try to see if we have covered the concept, the context of PHM, population management. If not, we'll ask the audience for if there are any other definitions of that. And then we'll get back, talk about the means of dealing with population, the current state, the state of the population management today in the respective settings that our panelists are involved with, the challenges and the road ahead. So without further ado, let me ask Amy to start our conversation with introducing herself and her perspective, her organization on population health management. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you to all for coming. My name is Amy Leidick and I work with the UCSF Global Health Sciences Group and I've been working for the last 10 years in the area of health, starting in uh, clinical health care, and then now I work mostly international public health data science. And the main project that I work on is providing technical support and program management to the South Africa HIV Data Use Project and the Data Use Project in general at UCSF Global Health Sciences. And what we do is develop tools and processes for visualizing data, mostly in the area of HIV, in different countries, mostly Southern Africa, Zambia, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Swaziland, and East Africa, Tanzania, and Kenya. Uh, last year, myself and colleagues founded the Global Health Innovative Technologies Initiative at UCSF, which we endearingly call GIDI. And uh, we are working to try to bring together the different innovations and technologies at UCSF that are usually used in healthcare domestically, and we want to try to share those practices um, with our colleagues and the work that we do internationally. Now for the question about population health, um, our organization in general is we provide this, this support for HIV programs, that to improve HIV programs, the treatment and prevention of HIV, through data use. And when I think of population health, I, I think of the outcomes and determinants of a group's health. And I, it's best to me understood in comparison to individual level care, where an individual level care would be a, a physician or a nurse providing care to a patient, whereas the population health would be the collection of all those patients and, and the information about those patients. In the context of HIV, which is where we predominantly work, individual level health would be a doctor providing treatment to an HIV positive patient, whereas the population health level would be uh, monitoring the changes in HIV prevalence among a certain group, maybe a country or a certain region within a country or even a group of people, so among women who are 15 to 24 years old or truck drivers, some type of group. You're assessing 
trends or patterns, and then also trying to understand why those trends or patterns are happening. And for population health management, this is essentially most of the work that we do at UCSF Global Health Sciences. So we take all this information, and then we try to dig down a little bit deeper, understand why it's happening, and then work on improving the health of these groups based on that information. So for example, we have, uh, we work with the Ministry of Health in South Africa as an example, and we've been watching the changes in the number of people testing positive for HIV. And, uh, and maybe an area in northern South Africa has seen a recent spike in HIV prevalence among men. So you dig a little bit deeper, trying to look into what's happening there, and you notice that maybe a copper mine has opened there, but there's no health services or any sort of access to health care for those working in the mine. So then you take it a step further and work with the programs in the area to expand health services to that group in that area. Thank you, Amy. And let me pass it on to the next panelist. Susan, please introduce yourself. And Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to be here. My name is Susan Merrill, and I work with Freed Associates, which is a consulting company in the Bay Area, larger Bay Area. Freed has been in existence for over 20 years and probably has worked with a number of you in the provider, payer, and technology arenas. I'm an epidemiologist by training, so population health and chronic disease management is something that's near and dear to my heart and something that I've done over the past 20 years or so. When I think about population health and when Freed thinks about population health, we help our clients in various ways, depending on where, where they are with population health. We look at it as a more broad and global kind of thing. There has to be some sort of plan or strategy to address population health. We look at it as the entire patient population for a provider or for a health plan. We look at some of the technology and data issues, lots of data issues, that exist in, in trying to understand the various strata that patients may fall in for risk, and that's risk both at the financial and the healthcare or condition level, chronic disease level. We look at the tools that are available, and we have come to realize that for population health management, Usually most organizations can use the tools they have. There doesn't necessarily need to be a brand new tool applied, but just different use or deeper use of the tools that exist. We also find that there is a lot of data quality. There are a lot of data quality issues and we try to help our clients address those. In addition to that, we look at staffing from the perspective of do you have the right people using the tools? Do you have the right people in the care management programs? We look at care management, we look at ROI. We look at all of the pieces that we think comprise population management. Thank you, Susan. Amanda? Hello, everybody, and good afternoon. Thanks for being here. I'm Amanda Goltz. I lead product innovation and strategy for Aetna's large national employer division. So if you are a big employer, you provide health benefits to your employees, and you're generally about 3,000 employees or larger, you, this will be familiar to my health plan colleagues in the room, but you do an arrangement called self-insurance, where you actually bear the risk. So if you work for Costco and you go to the doctor, Costco pays the bill, not Aetna, although it may say Aetna on your membership card. So for me, that means that our populations are defined as the employees, their dependents and families of groups as diverse as Costco, Goldman Sachs, McKesson, Google, Marriott. And what's interesting is that while on the surface, these populations would seem to be very different. They have very different job functions. Some are at desks all day, some are on their feet. Some of them live in areas where healthcare access is a ma major problem. Some of them live in places where there's such wonderful healthcare access that it's incredibly expensive. But another challenge and a layer on, on what I do is that the employers who are on the hook for the healthcare costs in these very narrowly defined populations tend to think of their populations very territorially, very specifically, such that if I find an amazing chronic disease management program for diabetes, and it's clinically validated, epidemiologically sound, and cost-effective, and I go to Safeway and I go to Costco, which are largely in the same business, and I tell them both of you have diabetics and they both live in San Mateo County, and I would like you both to do this, this program. I would like you to pay for it on behalf of your diabetics so that they get better care and they manage their disease better. They will tell me, no, a diabetic who works for Costco and a diabetic who works for Safeway, totally different. Why is that? Well, we have different benefits. No, you don't. I make them. You really don't. <laughs> so that's one of my challenges, is that what defines a population, even for the purposes of providing them with health care, has nothing to do with their health status. So that's something that's interesting to think about. Um, 
Another piece that, that we work on is we have uh, our own solutions. Aetna is in the fortunate position of being able to do things like buy a population health company. We bought Active Health a few years ago. But what that really means is that we have a very, very elegant and sophisticated way of identifying who needs help, who is at risk. We do not have great tools for then getting the last mile to that individual and engaging them in the program that will help them. And there's a lot of debate over whether that should be delivered through their physician and not through the health plan at all in the local community um, or through some other means. So that's sort of the, the challenge to everybody in this room or a possible conversation point is how do we solve that last mile problem? We know that you're in trouble. We know you're about to go to the emergency room. What do we do? Thank you, Amanda. And now would be a good time to ask uh, the audience here if there anybody wants to provide a different definition, different perspective, or their experience in definition of population health management. Any volunteers? Go ahead. That's a great, that's a great program. So the program I think that you're referring to is the Employer Center of Excellence Network at Pacific Business Group on Health. The only reason that's coming to me so fast is because I used to work on it when I worked there. Otherwise, I'd have no idea. But uh, it's a fabulous program. It's a great idea. Tremendous quality gains and cost savings. But they are having pro problems spreading that program out beyond the first few employers who signed on for exactly that reason. Wow, that works great for Walmart and Lowe's. We're different here. We don't do that. Why not? It'll save you so much money and people will be so much healthier and they're being the, the guardians of their own health. It's just not our culture. So that's what we struggle with. There is a comment or question from that gentleman. Uh, well, you were asking about population health. Right? Correct. Well, hopefully we will add us that. And as you mentioned, in the concept of the population health management has been around for a number of years. It's part of the same triple aim, better care, better health, lower cost. So as we're going to discuss, the, hopefully, through panelists, each one through their own experiences will look at it. And as you mentioned, probably a lot of them are looking at subset. As uh, in the case of Amy has mentioned, they're looking at a very well-defined subset of population. So population health management probably means different things to different group of people. But one of the key things I think you address is ultimately if it support, it's support, it's supposed to support those triple aims, it has to deal with those high cost patients which are chronic disease you know, management. So I like to hear throughout the conversation as well as from our colleagues here that 
how we would address or how we improve or address the triple aim. So starting with Amy, let's ask you, the, when you look at population management organization, what have you done that, in, and what approaches have you used that has been effective? What benefits you've received so far, and what has been your challenges? So the, most of the work that we do, like I mentioned, is related to data use, and we approach it, I don't think we're unique in this, but from two sides. So there's the data collection side, collecting this information, and then also the use of that information, which have to work together in order to be effective. If you just collect information and it sits there in a database, it's just a pile of numbers. So you need to use that information. Um, similarly, if you have, you want to use the information in order to analyze it, to, to interpret it, you have to first collect that information. So we do these two different sides, and I, I'll give an example of each that we have been doing in, in our organization. So in the data collection side, one example is in, earlier in 2013, we worked with the Ministry of Health in Uganda, and they were looking to prevent the transmission of HIV from pregnant women to their babies. And they wanted to do this by identifying pregnant women who are HIV positive and then making sure that they were on treatment. And they, this was meant to be a national program, and they decided they wanted to monitor, among these pregnant women, they wanted to monitor eight key indicators. So like the number of the women who are attending antenatal care, how many are being tested, of those being tested, how many test positive, of those tested positive, how many are in treatment, and how many stay in treatment. Now a huge challenge that we face is the, the different types of systems and different types of facilities, which I know is no, I'm sure most people in the room are aware that there's challenges of systems talking to each other. In our context, it's a range of a rural health facility that has one nurse with paper registers that are sometimes handwritten, sometimes not written at all, and then ranging all the way to, say, a main hospital in Kampala that has a fully electronic system. And the one, one thing across all these facilities that people use and are comfortable with and have access to is cell phones, so it's becoming a very popular mode of data collection using SMS or text technology. So with the, the ministry, we started having these nurse managers send the, the aggregate totals for their facility for each of these eight indicators. So at the end of the week, the nurse for that facility would send the text of the number of women tested, number tested positive. Uh, this information would go to a central database. It would be triangulated with the, the electronic systems and then displayed electronically on a dashboard that was access accessible to program managers, the ministry staff, and then they could look at, for the first time, this information in real time that's actually showing what's happening at these different facilities. Um, like to date now, we, this information is collected from about 1,600 facilities that see around 20,000 pregnant women a week. So it's, it's, we've had good success of the, people t of the nurses sending the texts and examples of information that, I guess, the that things that we identify from it, so there's a certain region that would drop off in their number of tests in a certain time of year. And we realized it was around the rainy season and they weren't able to be getting test kits because of problems with roads and transportation. So the, the ministry was able to identify specific facilities that were affected by this and then work on systems of bringing more testing kits earlier in the year and, and different systems. Where prior to, there was no knowledge of, of when test kits would run out, why it was a problem, just be that there weren't any test kits and people couldn't get tested. Um, for the other side, the data use side, um, a main tenant of what we do is providing skills and tools to uh, our colleagues that we work with in country. A huge challenge in international development is people from somewhere else come and provide a service, and then once they leave, so, so, so does that service and often the money associated with it. So we work, all of our work is based on um, working to build the capacity and training to the people in country on tools that have to be generally are free tools so that there's not a subscription, there doesn't necessarily need to be some funding attached to it in order to use them. Um, so we started doing these workshops in data, data use, we call it, but it's basically visualizing data. And so maybe a, a certain district in a country has information collected from all their health facilities, but it's always, it's just in a raw spreadsheet. They would use Excel. We do lots of workshops in Excel pivot tables, um, mapping, so QGIS. We've started using Google products, so my maps are just Google fusion tables where people are overlaying their, this information on top of Google maps. And then for the first time, they're actually seeing like the, the fruits of their labor. So 
they're noticing that they, there has been a certain a decrease in the number of new people testing positive, which is good. And um, through this program, we've, we've done it in eight countries. We're working through about, training about 250 ministry staff working in the area of HIV. And I, you were talking about data quality, which is definitely a big issue. And through this process, kind of something we didn't notice would happen is people really identifying the issues of data quality just by looking at their information. So they're looking at maybe over time from t 2010 to 2015, they're looking at how many people were tested, how many tested positive. And in some facilities, more people have tested positive than have been tested. So there's an issue of double counting, that's impossible, but there is issues of this, just looking at this information and seeing it in a picture, painting a story, is much easier to comprehend. And then from there, you can build your own story and your own solutions. So that's been very, just very, very helpful in, in getting the information out and then um, providing a context for people to plan and improve their programs. Thank you, Amy. So if I heard you correctly, uh, there are two aspects. One was the data collection, aggregation, harmonization. Seems to be a still a bit of challenge because there seems to be all over the map, still some paper-based information. And then the layer of analytics on top of that they can extract information to help you for positively impact either the delivery of the services or have a better understanding distribution of the population you have. That, that. So with that uh, segue, uh, can you share an anecdotal experience that you've been involved to, Susan, that you know, has similar challenges? Or your sure. challenges <laughs> that you've had faced with? Sure, there, I, an entirely different uh, life <laughs> than Amy, Amy has. What I can share with you is some of the trends that I've seen with some of the clients that we have, and I'll address your point too about the, the larger population issues and what we're beginning to see. One of the things that we've noticed is there, there isn't much of a strategy around population health for any of the folks that we work with. There's a realization we need to have it, but it isn't quite there, and instead it's taking the care management programs or the data analytic programs or even some of the financial ROI calculations and trying to make it fit into some bucket that doesn't really really apply to a strategy. So we are working with clients to help them better understand maybe where they need to go in a global perspective, more global perspective. Some of the things that we're finding, most of the clients I've worked with who have care management programs, those are being expanded. Traditionally, they're a bit like disease management programs in which they've addressed the sickest and or sometimes the highest risk, financial risk patients. But what we're seeing more and more of now is a recognition that all patients need to be addressed, especially how do we identify those patients that don't come in to the systems who aren't really touched by either the insurance or the providers and looking at ways to identify them. The different. One of the approaches that we've worked with is hiring people who are not clinicians necessarily to try to track down some of those folks. And from the data perspective, what we've been doing is working with the IT departments to include in the EHRs a way to capture information that is more about the social, some of the social factors, so that when a patient comes in, instead of just seeing its ABC disease, it's also seeing that, boy, they're having a hard time paying for food, or they don't have transportation, or whatever that might be. And then the case manager or the care manager can help address some of those issues. So we're just beginning to do that. I have yet to see software that addresses all of that. If anyone knows of that kind of software, I'd love to know what, what it is. So if I heard you correctly, you said that uh, for a lot of your organization, it's uh, the information they need is beyond just the specific medication or the healthcare. Other social determinants come into picture, and right now that information is not being captured as part of the population health management. It's captured, but it's not captured electronically yet. Oh, I see, okay. Yeah. So we don't have a systematic or yeah. you know, comprehensive way of aggregating mm -hmm. the non-health, like social factors into that, okay? Uh, let me hear from you, Evan, there are your experiences from a health plan perspective, how you guys have been collecting data and doing your population health management. Sure, so I, I would say that the health plan being the one who takes in the notice that something has happened to somebody and then pays something somebody else because it happened <laughs> is at the center of the, being the repository of data. If, if, if pure volume of data is what you're after, I think the health plan would really be who has it. But there's a difference between data collection and data meaning. 
and we struggle really, really hard uh, to make sense of the data that we do have. Um, so for a couple of reasons. Number one, having data on what happened to somebody is not the same thing as knowing mm -hmm. what happened. Um, we know that somebody was treated for something for the purposes of being reimbursed. We don't know if that's actually their chief complaint. Um, partly, you know, it's, it's sort of pointless to go down a, a blame game on it, but partly that's our own fault because we started to knit together interventions and diagnoses and require combinations to be paid. And when we did that, we made the data degrade. Um, it's also a sort of meta problem in the sense that if you're only paying when things are done, you don't know the value of the things that weren't done. So if I have a pre-diabetes program, a, a program for hyperglycemics that I think is very uh, effective at making people return to a normal metabolic profile before they become insulin dependent type 2 diabetics. I can't prove that it works, because how do you prove somebody didn't become a diabetic? I can prove somebody has diabetes all day long. They see an endocrinologist, they have a prescription for metformin, they do. I can't prove that somebody did X, Y, and Z, and that made them not become a diabetic, and that averted a ton of cost for whoever's holding the bag on that. So we struggle with that. How do we measure the value of care, specifically through bad things that didn't happen? Um, a second piece is that we've siloed data uh, by defining populations in a somewhat awkward way, and you were getting at this. We have wellness programs for people who are healthy, they don't need a doctor, but are at risk. Then we have chronic disease management programs for people who have a diagnosis. They generally don't share data, and sometimes that's our fault because we haven't built the bridges, and sometimes it's because the people who buy our services have decided on purpose they want those to be in silos. And what that means is if somebody's plummeting in the wellness program, we can't intervene from the disease management side. We actually have to wait until they have the disease and qualify for, for COPD intervention. That's a big problem. Um, so I think it's, it's breaking down the silos, it's making better sense of data, certainly among the social determinants of health, and this is a challenge I would put out to electronic health records and the ongoing challenge of health information exchange. Um, they, they're mostly functioning now with sophisticated billing systems. It would be fantastic if they started to create a true record of what was happening, both the functioning of the provider, what got paid for, what didn't happen, and sort of grew from there. Um, and then, of course, we have a, a third piece, which is totally a black box to us, which is what makes somebody change their behavior? What makes somebody start taking their meds? What makes somebody actually start getting on the treadmill every day? It's different for every person, but we have to find that motivator or else all of these interventions and programs aren't going to hit home. Some of that is happening through the provider, but some of that stuff is locked up in the person's brain, and we need a way to get to that. So that, those are the things that we think about. Well, so what I'm hearing from our panelists is, is that a lot of organizations are considering population management as possibly a disease management, which it's a subset, most likely. And as Amanda said, there are proliferation of wellness programs, especially with the proliferation of wearables, that a lot of healthy people are participating, and it's probably generating tons of data. So uh, I want to pose it to the question. Should the initial focus be on uh, disease management, chronic disease management? Is that the most important topic? Should it broaden that? Should the social determinants factor should be next key? Gen so I want to hear some of the comments and possibly questions from the audience before we move on to the next section of that. Go ahead. And this is probably not unique to, you know, children. I'm sure this is true across all ages, all demographics. So the quiz, and a lot of those social services are generally provided by other agencies and if not the health organization. So the question is that right now those two are apparently separate. 
efforts, right? Social services that. How would you bridge that gap? It looks like you want to comment on that? Go ahead. That's correct. Correct. <laughs> right. Correct. 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 Yeah. 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 Until he died, and that's really the customer. I mean, this is where I see the problem of this kind. I'm a good example. I I have a chronic disease, and but I'm really compliant. You would never find that I don't fill my prescriptions. I take my medicine because I know the relation between what I do today and what happens to me in the future. Yeah. But the population you serve, at Costco, at Costco, when you have to be dying, work for 20 years, to walk in the aisle with a cart, right. is not going to understand. Importance of his daily and lifetime adherence to these protocols, and so how do we how do we how do we get in the head of somebody who's not necessarily you know higher in a social economic education class to understand these things in a way that will keep them in the program, keep them doing the right things, and that's what I think is missing a lot of times. In these and in continuation, most of the studies do show that there is a high correlation between the social situation of the chronically diseased. Patients. So if that's the initial emphasis of population and management, because that's where the immediate impact could be, the question, the challenge is that how do you collect all the appropriate data in, that are impacting the health or the context of the health of that individual? How do you uh, analyze them and to provide better services for better care, lower costs? Because that's where it is. You know, wellness, as you said, probably mostly right now, every, you see every young person wearing a wearable. I have not seen a very old person wearing a wearable and trying to, you know, check this Fitbit, you know, results with the peer there. But so that probably can be postponed in the future, the, despite the fact that is generating significant volume of data that could be beneficial. I mean, I'm sure you guys are looking at wellness programs. So if that's a question, let me ask the audience here too. Oh, go ahead. There's more comment before we ask. So my doctor was uh, diagnosed with celiac, and we didn't know what celiac was or those kind of things. And basically, the pediatric GI just gave us a paper said, This is what it is. You talk to the nutritionist, she talked to us for five or ten minutes saying what it is, and now you're on a phone. But actually, what happened was the week following that, there was a support group that was meeting for years, and we got plugged into the support group. I believe we learned a lot in that half an hour than a prior interaction with the doctor or the nurse. Mm -hmm. And as the support group, like every three or four months you meet, the amount of information that you get from that support group is so much. The doctor doesn't have, in fact, the doctor sometimes comes every five, six months. He comes and gives you cutting edge stuff. But the support group is actually which keeps us together. I mean, we're kind of, my daughter is fit in that way. She's not falling off the wagon, as like what he was saying. But I, I believe that support group coming together as part of the hospital-driven effort makes a big difference. No, I hear you, absolutely. So it looks like, uh, going back to the question, that if access to data, appropriate data, especially for high-risk patients, chronic disease patients, and having information about their social context is important, what are some of the tools? I mean, you've been working in some possibly Amy countries that probably are in a social economic disadvantage too. What are some of the basic tools? I mean, these days you hear about big data, it's you know, very, getting a lot of popularity for collection of data as a means of collecting that data. You're hearing a lot of analytics. Could you address some of the tools that you guys have found that could be in terms of collection of data and analysis data important? So um, this is kind of similar to the, the data collection piece that I spoke of previously. Obviously, yes, my context is very different, but we, most of the health facilities and even the people working in and the analytics don't necessarily have access to internet. So we have to find means that don't use internet in order to collect information. Um, a huge benefit has been the development of open source offline tools. Um, ODK is, is, like, is through, through Google, but it collects information offline, and when you're connected to the internet, it would then um, upload the information. Um, the, the use of SMS texting is huge because Everybody has a, has a cell phone. Even you go to the most rural parts of Namibia, 
in the hut and grandma's on her cell phone. So everybody has a cell phone. People are comfortable with using them. Even if uh, maybe a certain, a small town has a computer and maybe has occasional access to internet, not everybody has been using a computer since they were in fifth grade like it is in the US. So the, using, the use of SMS texting has really helped in the data collection. A huge barrier, obviously, is the, the text can't be complex. The, the amount of information you can collect through the internet or through maybe an online form, even through a computer, is a lot Who collects more. the data? Is there a centralized depository when that SMS data comes in? Yeah, so in the case of Uganda, we, we built a data system that collects it. Okay. Um, there is, UNICEF has a program where they provide toll-free to, toll numbers to organizations that want to collect information through SMS texting. I, again, being that they want whoever's sending in the information, no cost to them. So UNICEF will provide this toll-free number for programs, and then in our case, the nurse managers are going to send a free SMS to this toll-free number that then is routed to be stored in our database. So you aggregate them, you collect them. Yeah. So you maintain that central clinical data repository or information about them. Yeah, and UCSF actually doesn't. It's now entirely in the hands of, of the Uganda ministry. Um, and we, like, partially through our global health initiative work is we work entirely with developers in country. So the developers are from Namibia, are from Uganda, partially to, to build um, business and employ people in the countries and because they know the context way better. So they understand, just, you know, how the type of internet that will be available, what kind of websites are going to work, which ones are going to take too long to load. Um, but so anyways, if it's all done and built by developers and people in country. Now let me ask Amanda actually that. It's known that health plans, as you mentioned, have tons of data, mostly claims related. But providers are always you know, wary of sharing data with them. So how do you see the, you know, kind of that, bridge, that gap to be bridged? And how can we ingest clinical claims data for the benefit of population health management? Sure, so a couple, um, a couple visions for it. One that's currently going on and another that sort of bridges the gap when we look into the future. You know, the first is I think wellness gets a bad rap because it is largely true that, you know, you're, if you have a fitness challenge at your employer, your 25-year-old marathoner will win it, not your 65-year-old <laughs> person who needs two new knees and has 15 comorbidities. Um, and that's a very valid criticism. I think what we haven't done enough with is to find the diamond in the rough and capitalize on all of that data that's been generated okay. through these programs. And what we're creating is sort of a shadow medical record, if you will, because a lot of employers ask their employees to fill, to fill out a health assessment and they incentivize that very, very heavily. Now, pieces of that health assessment are maybe not so reliable. If my employer is asking me, you know, how much I weigh and how much I work out every week, oh my gosh, I am like an angel, right? I, my behavior is perfect. Um, not to mention that a lot of people give false answers because they, they don't trust the, the security and the privacy of that data. I have friends who tell me, you know, I never do my health assessment at work. The health plan's gonna use that data against me, and I say, you wish we had the sophistication to use that data against you. <laughs> we, we definitely would if we could, but we can't. So, but what it has given us is it's given us two pieces of information we can't get anywhere else. Number one, how ready is the individual to change? Mm -hmm. We ask that. We ask validated measures of it. We use the activation measure developed at the University of Oregon. We ask it in a million different ways. We ask them what their goal is. What do you want to do? Nobody mm -hmm. says, you know what I would like to receive? Top-notch hypertension treatment. People say, I don't want to be sick anymore because I want to walk my daughter down the aisle or because I want to be able to go up the stairs without getting out of breath. We capture that and we try to bring it back to the intervention that makes sense and pick through our portfolio mm -hmm. of stuff for what's going to resonate with that person. So we take it on a population level so that we can figure out the solutions for the future and then we drive it to the individual level through engagement. So that's how we're using that, that data now. Another point on the, on the activity trackers, I do believe that they're a little bit faddish and we're going to get more sophisticated. But they have given us signals because they've given us something that the person wears that tells us what they're doing. So if I run three times a week for five months and then I quit, am I injured? Am I depressed? Is something wrong? It's another piece of data that we didn't know that we can act on. In the future, I think what we're looking to is, is to do sort of exactly the, the vision that you were pointing out, which is maybe this stuff shouldn't be coming from the health plan. Let's be honest. If I'm an Aetna nurse and I'm calling you during dinner to nag you about what you're eating, am I going to pick up the phone? No. Is your doctor calling you going to make you change? Maybe. 
So where we're going is we're, we're leaning very heavily on accountable care as the model of the future. We're building mm -hmm. a tech platform mm -hmm. that enables accountable care organizations. It's not just a piece of fancy mm -hmm. contracting or a network play. It's really, here's a platform. When Aetna people come to you in this accountable care organization, here are the things we want you to do to them. Here are the things that we want you to tell us about what was done to them. And here's different tools that make you able to deliver better care. The doctor shouldn't be spending their time doing things like those super helpful patient communities. They sh we should give them staff, those former Aetna nurses who used to call you during dinner, let's send them out to do exactly that at the local level. And so that's the vision for the future. And now, Susan, uh, in the organization that you have been uh, consulting with, uh, one of the missions is that it's mostly we're talking about the enterprise side. What is the role of the patient? That, and what should be their engagement process into what are the challenges of engaging them, as you said, because ultimately it looks like it requires some behavior modification if you really want to improve population health. That's a great question, and I think it's a question that most of our clients are asking. Different clients have tried different things. One of the things that we found to be really helpful is just asking patients how they like to be communicated with. Some people like texting, some people like email, some people want a phone call, some people want face-to-face, -face, some people want a group, some people actually want to be with their peers and others who have similar conditions. And so one of the strategies that we've been helping to employ is, first of all, collecting that information, second of all, looking at the different modalities for actually delivering messages and appropriate mm -hmm. messages at appropriate levels. You don't want necessarily the same message to go to people who are very sick, who are maybe not very well educated, who aren't going to understand the complex terms. It has to be simple and in the context of their lives. So there's a lot of different messaging that needs to go on. There's, there are a lot of different modes of communication. And then there's also the patient responsibility. So there have, in one client, there have begun to be discussions between the nurse and the patient or the doctor and the patient with what the patient's role is and what the patient really wants to happen and how they can help make a difference. So there are different different tacks being taken. In my experience, it's it's still in nascent stages. Mm -hmm. So let me uh, then uh, ask the audience for comment on that. As we are hearing that patient is the next important you know pillar of this population management. What are some of the experiences or some of the be, uh, best approaches that you've seen to improve patient engagement in the population management? Because without them, as if they're not accepting the processes that are being suggested to them, especially in the chronic disease, you know, folks, what, you know, what, it, what is the option? What can be done? Should the health coverage be like, you know, there are people say that if they're not responsible, then they should, you know, they should pay higher for their health care costs. Is that, is the financial penalty or incentives is usually the best approach to get patient engaged? Go ahead. So I can personal experience after working in the drug industry. Um, it's amazing to me the difference between the type of patient contact that I get for an expensive medication that's specialty care versus my retail pharmacy medications. Both of them, there's an incentive to get me to refill, but there's an order of magnitude difference in the, the, the degree to which I get contacted on both. And so the question that I have is, wh where is that right level? that we get to kind of get a, improve patient adherence or what have you. So that it's, you know, clearly it's driven by the drug companies at this point, but how does the health plans and, and various uh, governments get involved to provide sort of an up level of, of uh, patient adherence? Well, let me ask the audience, how many of you are part of an organization that have a wellness program that you have to actually do pre-screening, generally raise your arm, and your health you know, coverage and your portion of the, I mean, you know, financial responsibilities is dependent on that program. How many are in, involved in the program? Okay, that looks like not, it's not that yet, you know, prevalent that too. But this, this seems to be increasing number of organizations who are now actually asking employees for a screening, right, and wellness programs, and is the health plans are actually, as part of their SLIS, service level agreements with organizations, are they pushing that? to get better information, to get more patient engagement? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, we, 
one of our recommendations, um, we try to be very careful about we, what we incentivize and what we recommend to an employer that they ask their employees to do. We, we don't want to collect data for data's sake. We want to understand what we're going to do with it and how it's going to help people. Um, where One place where we lift that rule is for ourselves. So Aetna Inc., the employer, not just Aetna the health plan, the company that I work for, has incredibly strong requirements to do exactly that. And in fact, how much premium I pay, and trust me, the premiums are considerable, it's Aetna, um, is dependent entirely on not just measurements that I submit, but outcomes. So I am at risk for my five metabolic risk factors. For each risk factor of the five that I miss, I pay a greater proportion of my premium. And so after the requirement is scanned, I think what's going to come after that is sort of an incentive for outcomes. Where I think that's going in a more sophisticated way is to ask uh, people how they want to improve their health and what they should tackle first, along with their doctor, design treatment plans, and then measure the, both the patient and the provider on the adherence to that treatment plan. So we're getting away from the units that were done, paying for volume, and getting towards the outcome. So if I set a goal for my patient, I'm a physician, that they should hit these markers by the end of the year, both myself and the patient are responsible for them. And I think those are the, the tr things we're trying to drive to, rather than saying, here's an abstract goal, you get there on your own, because that almost never works. Question, go ahead. I just want to add something about the, the, the curious question. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. some of our pharmacists are training, and uh, I work for health my experience, the big thing for incentivizing patients when I deal with that about the patient mm -hmm. I, I'm finding that because I'm dealing with a lot, a lot of the elderly population, also a geriatric population, a lot of them are incentivized to take their, their medications because they have that support. And the support is that they have, even if it's uh, they have a grandson or it's a So again, the social setting and the level of support, and that's where I guess for a lot of population, especially chronic disease, that may be the missing factor. The social setting, the social economic context they're in may not have, if, if for instance, if a chronic disease patient cannot even get a right to go see the physicians, they may not be that compliant to a lot of that too. That, in the comment? Mm -hmm. So if you look at the way dollars are spent on professional services and healthcare, you have two specialists for every one primary care, but actually $4 flows to the specialist for every one dollar primary care. And the issue you have is that if you're a primary care physician, you're taking care of chronically diseased patients, and you're being paid on encounters of one to four, it doesn't allow you to figure out a way that it's a social issue. That, again, they show this. So when people are getting vaccinations, for example, if the pediatrician takes some, the time to educate the patient about why they should be vaccinated, there's a huge difference in the vaccination rate between those who are educated and those who are not. And so my question, I guess, is the fact that, and I need to create to see something, it's sort of like you guys on each side of this conversation, is, and I know that Medicare, for example, now has this new program where you can get reimbursed every month if you're responsible for a patient. Do you guys, I mean, is these, are these successful programs? Do you see these growing? My concern also with ACOs is that I'm not sure every doctor wants to join an organization that makes them part of it. It's back to the IPA, what am I sharing? them and as nurses will spend their time and energy on a patient instead of worrying about whether it's a 15 minute office visit or a five minute office visit or a 20 minute office visit, which is how they live today, frankly. And I presume you're assuming that this transition from fee for service to the captive model is not addressing that. So I'm going to ask well, our panelists. It doesn't, because it doesn't recognize that. Again, an example, if you know much about docs, if you live in a geriatric, if you're a, most of these docs choose their populations. And so mm -hmm. some of them focus on geriatrics, 
And if you get the same reimbursement for for a woman who's you know 60 with 70 problems, and you get paid the same for an office visit for a person who's 40 and healthy with a Fitbit, you you're not. It's not an equivalent level of effort work for those two populations. And yet, I mean, it does recognize some of it, but it it still doesn't incent property for that conversation to occur. I I believe maybe I'm wrong. All right. Well, let's hear from panel. So, how have you seen this care coordination model economically being addressed? I can start. Uh, well, it's an, it's a new code, right? Started in January, and my experience with three different clients is that they're they're still talking about it. How do you figure out who gets that code? Because it can apply to one patient per month for one provider, and so if you've got a care team. Which, which provider gets that? And, and the, most of the conversations have gone toward it being the PCP, but there have also been some conversations about actually a different model where the care team, it's a pool, sort of like the ACO monies. And to that point, we've, I've worked with ACOs for the last few years, different ones in the state, and my experience there is that there's a lot of focus on the financial modeling and there's not quite as much focus on the strategy for the care. It's, there's some in the care management bucket, but again, it's not a complete strategy. And so there's, there's that disconnect between the finance and the actual care, except when you have to report the quality measures at the end of the year for a sample of a population. So I don't, I mean, in my experience, we're not quite there yet. Yeah, I think that's largely right. I think, I think if you've seen one ACO, you've seen one ACO. They come in a million flavors and types. And, you know, I think it would be fair, I haven't done nearly the study of them that you have, but I think it would be fair to say that a lot of them are just a fee-for-service chassis with a little bonus for quality measures. And the quality measures are set to the level you did last year, so like something's really wrong if you lose, right? right. I think what we're focusing on is how do we just throw fee-for-service out completely because we have two advantages. <laughs> Number one, we know exactly how sick your population is. We processed all their claims last year. Number two, we're going to do it as a joint venture. So we're not going to come to the table with the hospital and to the provider, and this is exactly what we did with Innova Health in Virginia, and say, here's the deal, take it or leave it. We're going to say, we form a new company. You have our insurance license. We have your provider functions. What do we do with it? And we build it from the ground up. Is that going to look totally different in every place we have a joint venture? Yes. Is that a scalability problem that CMS doesn't love? Yes. Is it probably the right way to do it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. I've been given a notice of one minute, so I want to make sure there's any other question, comments. I hear them. I saw a couple of, yeah. CMS for non face to face chronic management, is that going to go towards commercial care? I mean, is that happening? Yeah, I think what we would do is once there's a model nailed down that we know CMS likes, it'll become part of Medicare Advantage, which is the private commercial form of Medicare. Go ahead. Uh, I have been involved with population management fairly successfully for maybe 20 years. Uh, I was part of the community management group. And uh, I think that's a huge gorilla, at least in California, that has been doing these kinds of things for decades already. Uh, how much can we learn from the Kaiser Permanente experience in trying to replicate some of their success stories? It's a great question. I, if more information were shared, if everyone had the money to input the EHRs in the same way, if there was a strategy around employed physicians and a fully enclosed model, I think there could be a lot that could, a lot that could be done. And I certainly think we can learn from the lessons that Kaiser has shared publicly and has published. I, I'll, you also may, you know, I mean, I don't know your. Uh, assuming that that model they have is single provider, health plan, all that coverage, that may be the model because then you have access to all the information. But we are within a very heterogeneous healthcare delivery processes. It's still a large number of independent physicians in clinics and practices and all that too. So I think uh, a lot of them probably very good experiences there, but challenge is that we are still dealing with very, very complex health delivery, you know, I mean, uh, infrastructure throughout the country in terms of still separation of providers, payers, practices, hospitals, acute facilities, non-acute facilities. And managing population health across these heterogeneous system probably is still going to be topics of discussion that we're at the end of our time. If there's no more comment, I'm going to tag on panelists. Let, uh, please join me in thanking them.